Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started. I know people are probably still um, jumping on, but I want to be um, sensitive to everybody's time. I know we're all certainly busy um, trying to get kind of our, our lives and our company back on track. Uh, but hello, my name is Karen Emmy. I'm the Executive Director of Thai Oregon. Thank you all for joining us. This is our second of several webinars where we are exploring how to survive the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we have an outstanding panel lined up today, but first I want to um, thank our sponsors. Um, and those folks are listed on the screen right now. So if you are in need of support, um, bankers, lawyers, accountants, um, funding, please take a look at who you see on the screen and give them a call. They have been great supporters of Thai and um, we'd love for you to take advantage of their services. Couple of housekeeping items. This webinar is being recorded, so you can reference um, it to, at a later date or forward on to your colleagues. Please make sure that your phones are muted, and we will have plenty of time for Q and A. Um, but we'll ask that you ask those questions in the chat box to the side. So again, just. Um, enjoy we've got a great panel here today but first i'm going to hand it over to our moderator who is a general partner over at elevate capital and is a member of the thai oregon board so please help me welcome jill jill nelson hey everyone um thank you carrie and it's great to be here with uh three of portland's amazing leaders uh, we've got kate winkler from ruby we've got kate johnson from acton and Jake Weatherly from Sheer ID. Thanks to uh, to all of you for for being here and helping your fellow entrepreneur and Portlander um, get through this this COVID um, pandemic and and business crisis. Um, like to kick off uh, today's format is a, a panel of just how are how are you leading through these times? What what are the particular challenges? We'll go through try to hit every aspect of the business um, that will take, you know, maybe the first half of this segment and then we'll open it up to panelists um, or excuse me to participant questions and I'll be reading them off and and welcome your response. Um, I'll call on each of you so that we can stay somewhat organized. But once we've had the opportunity to talk, feel free to, to pipe in and um, and talk off off each other. So without further ado, um, would love for each of you to introduce yourself, introduce your company for those um, on the on the webinar today who are not familiar what you do and, and um, where you're calling in from and, and, um, and the environment that you're you're working in physically working in today. We'll start with uh, at the top there, Kate Winkler. With Ruby. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, so I'm Kate Winkler. I am the uh, recently appointed CEO of Ruby. I had the unique pleasure to get over to take uh, to take this business over from uh, from Jill Nelson uh, last September. So I am uh, joining everyone today. For those who are not familiar with Ruby, what we do is we deliver live reception and chat services to small businesses. And really think about that piece of the small business economy that's very small businesses. So the typically the one to five employee small businesses, it's about 30 million of them in the US today. And our goal right now is really to make sure that those folks, because they are the uh, the largest sector of our economy, to make sure that they, they survive this pandemic that we're going through today. So this has been a very unique uh, situation for us in particular, because we're definitely seeing quite a bit of stress and demand on those folks. And, uh, and I am joining everyone today, um, oddly enough, from Santa Cruz, California, not, uh, not in Oregon right now, but um, it is 70 degrees. So I've got, I've got a nice day that I'm sitting in my yard. Awesome. Thank you, Kate. Let's go to Kate Johnson. Hey, the other Kate today. Hello, everyone. Um, so my name is Kate Johnson. Um, I'm the CEO at Acton Software. For those of you that aren't familiar with Acton, we're a digital communication tool uh, for marketers. Uh, we're an automation platform that drives customer experience from, you can think of it from kind of initial awareness and, and acquisition, but then all the way through retention and customer loyalty. Uh, we focus a large part on sort of small to, to mid-sized marketing teams. Um, and, you know, we've, we've been 
uh, in the Portland market for a little over 10 years, about 11 years. And we do all forms of, of digital communication, which uh, is increasingly important in this time where uh, people are no longer meeting in person. So we do email marketing, website lead gen, you know, account-based marketing, social marketing, all, all the different forms of, of digital communication that a customer may have uh, with, I'm sorry, company may have with their customers or their prospects or was, uh, the last month uh, in this in this home office has, has been has been new for me um, but uh, you know it, getting making it work just like everybody else glad to be here today that's great thank you Kate and Jake you look like a total uh, at-home veteran in your in your sport <laughs> coat <laughs> before we started I was saying I, a chapter in my career was work from home and I found the only way that I could do it effectively was to get up, have my coffee, read the news, shower, put a suit on, and just go full professional. So I'm trying to bring back formal Fridays instead of casual Fridays, but unfortunately my team isn't uh, jumping on board so quickly. But thanks for having me, everyone. And uh, Jill, thanks for moderating today. Um, I'm here from Sheer ID, uh, CEO and co-founder. Uh, we started Sheer ID in 2012 to bring invited personalization uh, to consumers and to marketing leaders. And we do that by verifying eligibility and basically creating customer journeys from interest in a program that's specifically designed for them to verifying that they're eligible and then uh, becoming a customer or subscriber, evangelist, etc. cetera. Uh, I am on Zoom from my bunker in uh, Eugene, Oregon. Um, two stories below, uh, three young boys who are trying to uh, learn how to uh, be good students from home. Quite challenging and uh, so far a pretty fun and interesting experience. Uh oh, did we lose Jill? <laughs> yeah, it looks like it. I think Jill may have frozen. <laughs> uh oh, all right. Let's, um, hey, we've done the intro. Let me see, maybe if I un just unmute her. Hey, Jill, are you still there? I'm not able to unmute her. I feel like we did lose her. So why don't we, um, let's go ahead and start, um, start off with the questions. I've got them here. Let me just pull them up. Um, of what Jill had sent us earlier. Yeah, I think next we're supposed to talk about what a typical day it looks is. like. Yep. Yeah, so. Okay, well, let's do that. How about we'll start with Kate Winkler again? Excellent. What is a typical well, day I will like? tell you, um, unlike Jake, my morning starts with me picking up the dirty hoodie off my floor, <laughs> putting it back on, and, uh, and really just getting right into the nitty gritty for the day. Um, you know, before COVID-19, most of my day was really spent um, planning long-term strategic initiatives for the business. Yes. I'm really focused you know, technology planning percent of my day now is focused on 99.9 percent .9 work from home, meaning um, we've got 600 employees that in less than 10 days we sent every one of them home minus 10 people. Um, and those 10 people, interestingly enough, are in a situation where they are unable to work from home. So we've made um, some unique exceptions for those two folks to allow them to continue to be employed and make sure they can continue to support their family. But coordinating the logistics and communication, not only around employees, but my management team and my executive team, my board, investors, lenders, et cetera, um, I, I spend 80% of my time today just focused on um, productive and proactive communications to all of those folks, inclusive of customers. And um, so it, it is very, um, is very different, you know, today and the reality is, is we're planning 
um, our business around what if this sticks around for 18 months, not even what if this sticks around for 90 days. I don't think there's any scenario that this is only a 90 day impact. And so we're very proactively as a business planning for um, you know, the COVID-19 impact to be extensive. I'll go ahead and, and go next so we can kind of keep the same order. Um, so my day starts out a little bit more like Jake's. <laughs> I found that for me um, in this new environment, sticking to a routine that was more similar to what it was before works best for me. So I get up, I work out, I shower, I get dressed, um, and, and that's kind of how I like to start my day. Um, you know, it's my day's definitely changed, I think, similar to you, Kate, a lot in the what I do from a day-to-day -day basis. I find um, really, most of my day is spent very similar to what we're doing right now, which is on Zoom video calls. Um, I am in Zoom meetings uh, or some type of meeting, uh, probably you know between six and eight hours every single day. Which I was always in a lot of meetings, as I think any any CEO is. But there's just a uh, higher need right now to have individual touch points with people. Where um, in the in, in office environment, which we mostly did have at Act On, we have about 180 employees. The majority of them uh, were in the office there in Portland. Not all, but probably 80 percent. We saw each other on a day-to-day -day basis, and so a lot of um, communication happened on the fly. You just, you know, get up and walk from one desk to the other and have a conversation. Now, none of that happens unless you make an effort to either uh, do it in, in a meeting, in a scheduled meeting or an impromptu meeting, and or on Slack, which is what we use for our sort of, you know, day-to-day -day kind of impromptu short communications. Um, so I'm finding that I'm having to kind of prioritize my work a little bit differently. Um, if I'm not careful, I will spend the entire day on, on video calls, uh, and then it's then it feels a little bit more difficult to actually, you know, get a bunch of things accomplished, like all the all the other things that are still happening, such as you know strategic planning and uh, what are we focusing on next quarter versus sort of what's the immediate operational um, need of the day. Um, spending a lot more time checking in with with customers. Um, some of them are, are coming to us proactively. We're reaching out to others, um, finding out how they're dealing with the situation. There's a lot of needs for right now um you know customers needing to you know deal with us a little bit differently than they normally would whether that be a uh, request for sort of you know we're a subscription-based company software subscription so requests for some relief on on timing of when they might be able to pay us um to um, flipping that around to the other side which is some companies who have a lot more business or activity that they need to do right now uh, needing to work with us on actually purchasing more. So there's a lot of our, like our account management team and executives are, are speaking to customers uh, way more frequently than we were before. Uh, additionally, there's a need to communicate with the employees on a much more regular basis. Uh, you know, having very, very frequent touch points with employees, I think for my leadership team and for myself is really important. We're trying to be very visible. We know this is sort of a challenging time for everybody and we want uh, to make sure everybody feels very comfortable that they know what's happening at the company, kind of good and bad. Uh, we try to, 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 you know, hit both sides of the communication, but I think the biggest change for me is just the fact that I've, you know, I, I'm on meet, I'm in meetings the entire day, and some of them were regularly standing meetings that we had before, and some of them are new meetings that, that we're doing on a regular basis. So it's a kind of a time prioritization, time management, that, that, that was kind of a big change for me. Jake? Hey, um, okay, so day to day, I think uh, for me, very similar to what Kate and Kate uh, both shared, more meetings, uh, more proactive communications. When we chose to shut down our offices a few weeks ago, um, I initiated uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, all hands, uh, which we've been sticking with. Uh, I also initiated a, a morning uh, in essence, COVID-19 task force, where we meet first thing in the morning, we discuss headlines, changes, uh, any effect on customers, any effect on our own team members, families, partners, etc. Uh, and we're trying to, um, I guess, stay ahead of it, or at least, you know, react quickly um, to changes. Um, a lot of my meetings are about focus, right? One of the things I think that this has been a, a catalyst um, for at Shear ID is to get back to our roots in terms of core product, the foundation that we've built over all these years, and really facing quickly and honestly and authentically that what we don't have right now are the luxuries of experimentation or, you know, trying to establish the next beachhead um, 
fortunately for Sheer ID, we're not super closely tied with hospitality, quick serve restaurant, food and beverage, those kinds of areas that have either shut down or dramatically declined. Uh, we do have some customers who use our verification technology um, at point of sale, like literally baked into their cash registers. And unfortunately, those customers have closed all of their stores, uh, with the exception of Lowe's Home Improvement, uh, which is actually humming along. Seems that a lot of people have a little bit more time for those uh, projects that were on the back burner, and, uh, and they're out there getting it done, weekends, evenings, maybe even during work time, I'm not sure. Um, I would also say it's been super helpful and valuable to do more um, skip step meetings and to uh, meet with groups on the front lines. The number one sort of most valuable source for information hour by hour, day by day right now comes from our customer success folks, customer service, opening and closing tickets, um, certainly our SDRs on the front lines, working with prospective customers and existing customers. And a lot of it is really about um, fortification. Um, it might be kind of corny, but I'm a small town boy. Um, I keep using the analogy of what farmers do during the winter, which is sharpen their tools and rebuild their tractor engines in order to prepare for you know spring planting. And I think that if we're able to find any kind of silver lining here, it's uh, an opportunity to zero in on what matters, what's core, and to make sure that all of that preventative maintenance and, and planning is established, yet at the same time super flexible, uh, under the assumption that uh, our recovery is fast, that this is a V-shaped phenomenon. Uh, when does that steep recovery start, and are you ready for it? Love it. You guys, sorry to go away from you for a minute there, uh, but thank you for continuing on and awesome, really great insight. You guys are all touching on areas that I want to dig deeper into. Um, appreciate, but before we, I want to hear how, you know, how is business for everybody? Is it, you know, how has it changed? But before we go in, you guys are talking a lot about meetings and working with your employees. I'd love to dig a little bit deeper into, you know, how are you leading during this time. Um, you know, I, I can only imagine that employees obviously are very, very um, uh, dedicated and thankful to have, you know, a great company to work for during this time. Um, I also imagine that many of them are navigating homeschooling their children or worried about their own health conditions or just the, the scariness that is out there. So how are you and your teams, how are you beyond regular meetings for you know to keep the wheels of commerce turning how are you thinking about your own leadership and what are you asking of your teams and and how you know what's the environment of your of your staff and beyond beyond just day-to-day -day business what are you what are you sensing and how are you reacting um why don't we start with jake we'll go to you first okay great yeah i think right now putting yourself in in the shoes of of team members and um you know, appreciating their perspective. Um, so we have some folks who, you know, live alone in an apartment in New York City, right? And we have other folks who live out in the country with a bunch of children running around who don't have a, you know, school campus to go to. Um, some whose um, young adult children are now home for the first time in quite a while because their university shut down and they're trying to navigate that whole thing. So from my perspective, I think, you know, I've just tried to really double down on, on my style and, and what has worked in terms of, of leading this team and growing this team, which is um, transparency, um, authenticity, and uh, being evidence-based, uh, understanding where there can be increasing anxiety, understanding how we can work together in order to stay productive. One of the things that I keep getting uh, from team members is working on uh, the, the things that they're doing at Sheer ID. Right now feels like a vacation from life and a vacation from reality. It's kind of nice to not have the 24 hour news cycle on in the background and instead to focus on a customer who has a really exciting program and has asked us to help them help 
nurses and doctors, for example. So looking for those like shining examples of A, how we can help, B, how we can do like our life's work and C, how to stay enthusiastic and healthy. Um, the other thing that we found is uh, we've always uh, adhered rigorously to the Agile Manifesto and to Scrum methodology and engineering, um, to some degree also in marketing. And what we've done uh, as a re result of a series basically of presentations in all hands by our Scrum masters on the engineering team is we've adopted uh, what's right for each functional area of the business in terms of a daily stand-up meeting and uh, plan for the week and focusing on blockers and bottlenecks and clearing those blockers and bottlenecks. But I would say the headline is back to the basics, focused and evidence-based. Uh, actually, a couple of other things just culturally that we've been doing that are really, really fun. So uh, we have an individual who is an amazingly accomplished a uh, watercolor artist. Mm -hmm. He's been doing painting with FJ once a week in the evenings. Uh, we've had a couple of virtual happy hours. We've had cross-departmental teams. We're also geographically dispersed mm -hmm. from Europe to East Coast to Middle America to West Coast. And so to some degree, um, some of these communication lines were already really well established, so we're really trying to double down on that. But also just, you know, have fun and, and use this as an opportunity to get to know one another in a digital world. Right. Awesome. So it sounds like it, a lot is just stay focused and business. Have you, so either um, Kate or Kate, have, it, have any of you had to make accommodations or, or change? And Kate Winkler, why don't we hear from you? You have a lot of people, I know. <laughs> we do. So we've, we've got a fairly unique um, workforce, probably to most of the folks on the call. So with 600 employees, um, about 450 of our employees are hourly workers making 1550 an hour um, and above. And so for most of these folks, they live in, in, they live in shared environments with multiple people. Um, they live with family members and they don't have technology at home. They don't have the uh, typical infrastructure that you need to effectively work from home. And most of our workforce is from the millennial uh, population, which means they've never been through anything like this before. They weren't in the job force in 2008 and 2009. So there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty from those folks as well. So from our perspective, one, we had to get a and in a proactive communication out to our workforce very quickly, um, which was one, let's all realign on our purpose because the best way to get through this together is really focusing on what we do and what we do best. And that really is delivering this amazing service to small business through, um, and really at this point, why it's so critical, if every single one of these small businesses that are now all of a sudden are distributed and no longer able to capture all of their inbound activity, whether that's an existing customer or a new piece of business, that threatens the survivability of small businesses. So the first thing we did was with that entire population saying, folks, now is the time, regardless of where we are working, we cannot actually let our purpose falter. We really need to help these small businesses. It is absolutely critical for the health and well-being of our communities and our economy. And in 100% of our population, and Jill very well knows because she created the culture at Ruby, really said, how can I help and how can I help in any way? So prior to um, February 29th, when the first COVID case in, um, in Oregon showed up, Ruby did not have a work from home plan or strategy. So we had never deployed work from home in any significant magnitude. Um, and we were able to get um, 600 people working from home in 10 days. And, and I will tell you, that that includes the creation of the plan the rollout of the plan breaking about 25 things in the process and finding and actually saying it's okay to break things right now because we're trying to do the right things one for our customers by providing that continuity of service and two for our employees to ensure that they are safe that they are at home and they have continuity of income particularly for our um, our hourly worker population, because there was tremendous fear um, going on 
within our population because many of those folks have roommates that lost their job that can't contribute to rent anymore. And, um, and again, it was a, a very emotional situation that we had to deal with very proactively. So we over communicated. We reached out and said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to get work from home. The day we're going to force this is the day that the schools start shutting down. And I said, in, in my point of view, I told my team, I said, I think, I think we have 10 days. And it was literally 10 days on the nose where we said, everyone's got to go home. And, uh, and we, Jill knows because she's on my board, I sent out the note going, by the way, on February 29th, I'm buying 100 computers today. <laughs> and I know that sounds crazy because we have one case in Oregon, but this is going to get bad and this is going to get bad quickly. And so, um, so we really tried to run in front um, of the situation so we could have a level of management and control and set a communication protocol with our employees and our customers to say, we are doing everything we can to make sure you have continuity of service and continuity of income, because those things were just so absolutely critical to, uh, to everything that we do. Um, but I would say probably the most important piece is um, we were honest but compassionate. Um, we set ground rules at the executive level and even with the board that said, now is the time to be flexible. Now is not the time to say, oh, you're not, you missed an hour, you checked in late on your clock time. Um, now is the time to be flexible. Um, and to the point where when you send 600 people home, not everyone can work from home. Um, so we do have 10 people that are, are incapable of working from home for a multitude of reasons. And those 10 people we figured out, or they're incapable of working their existing shift that they normally have because they have an infinite home and they have no family and they're in shelter with no support. So we've been creating projects for those folks to be able to do work while their children are sleeping and project-based work to provide them again, continuity of income. And for the folks that, um, that couldn't work from home, we have rolled out a dispersed seating program within our offices. We're continuing to have uh, those, those 10 people that are in an office um, professionally bio cleaned. They have all the supplies that they need, um, et cetera. But uh, I, I will tell you the credibility, and, and I heard this as well from both Jake and Kate, the communication, proactive communication, the honesty and reality, but without the fear, what everyone wants is, is, is credibility right now. And, and unfortunately, you know, the glass three quarters full is, is not helpful, but the the fear and the doom and gloom is also not helpful. So it's finding that balance in, uh, in the middle here. Those are great points, Kate. You know, one of the things that I found, and, and we're getting a lot of unsolicited, real positive feedback from team members, is less formal, less agenda driven, and more like, let's pop onto our screens together and just have a Q&A session. Or this person's going to present because 20 years ago they started working from home at IBM and they've developed some really, really basic but hugely impactful like tips and tricks and best practices. Um, so some of those just kind of like open forums and, and opportunities for people just to be together uh, seem to be super valuable and really appreciated. We've definitely found as well, and, and I totally agree, Jake, the, um, you know, people, we've got, we, we are communicating over multiple different channels to our employees and largely because they consume information differently. So now we have all these employees from at home. So getting on a VPN and checking their email when again, our frontline hourly workers, they don't have email on their mobile phones. So we have to have an open website that they can go to to get employee updates. We have to be able to have real-time communication tools. We happen to use, instead of Zoom, we use the Microsoft platform, so very active with using Teams as our internal infrastructure. Um, we publish emails for those folks that do log in and, again, are looking for that information in real time. But it is, it's definitely been one of those things where we have to acknowledge the diversity of our workforce and people consume information very differently. And, uh, and, and interestingly enough, the other balance is um, there are some people that, that you know, you're solving for 80% of the information or 80% of your population that you want to know. 10% is going to say, that's too much information. You're freaking me out. <laughs> and 10% are going to say, oh my gosh, that's not enough. Tell me more, tell me more, tell me more. What do I need? And, and you're going to always have exceptions. 
but you can, and, and I've learned this one from Jill, you can't manage to that exception 20%. You really have to focus on the core of the message, the core of the communication, because I've certainly had people send negative feedback saying, oh my gosh, I'm not getting a raise right now. How dare you? And, and I'm, wow. <laughs> and I'm like, but I'm like, you know what? This person's scared. They haven't been through this before. They have a roommate that lost their job. I need to be compassionate right now. And that was the, that's the most important thing. So you have to remember in a situation like this, you're going to have, those are the times when I think compassion and empathy really have to come in and in over way and say, we're just dealing in an environment where people are, are very scared right now. Great insight. Kate, do you, Kate, J, KJ, or I don't know how I should refer to KJ's fine. Okay, I'll hand your KJ now. Um, do you have any additional insights? Yeah, no, those, are, those are both really good feedback from both uh, Jake and, and, and KW. Um, yeah, I, you know, I think flexibility was really important for us. Um, you know, we, we, we also didn't have a, a work from home policy um, and we didn't have a, a large portion of the employee population that was working from home on a regular basis, but we did have the technology that we needed to enable it um, between Slack and laptop, everybody having laptops and all that. So, te so technology was all in place. So from that perspective, it was a pretty smooth uh, transition. We sort of just did it overnight. We just, one, we, on a Thursday, we said, hey guys, we need to do this. We're starting tomorrow. Um, but, but flexibility, I think, was really important because everybody's home situations are very different. Um, you know, in some cases, you have two working parents with two younger children, and we've had to tell the employees, like, that, that's okay. Like, you can work different, different schedules. Like, you know, we're not holding you to an eight to five at your desk. Um, if, you and your, if you and your spouse need to take turns working, you know, as long as you're getting your work done, we're really not concerned about how you're getting it done or when you're getting it done. I think that flexibility um, was really important to people to feel like that pressure kind of removed from them or even just little things like all of a sudden you're in a meeting, even if you're talking to a customer and a dog's barking because somebody rang the doorbell, you know, people started out like, oh my gosh, they were super embarrassed and muting their phones and everybody's kind of like, you know what, we're all doing, you know, it's okay. Everybody's dealing with this. It's, it's just make, take, kind of taking that pressure off of people. So they just feel like, oh, okay, this is okay. Like, you know, and so there's enough stress going on right now. And also we've made sure that the employees know about what resources we have available to them. So some people, um, you know, want to take advantage of our employee assistance program that, um, you know, if you're, if you're uh, you know, just really having a hard time, we want people to know that there are resources out there for them that they may not even have been aware of, even though we had, we've always had them. Um, so just being really aware of people's personal situations and, and just, you know, taking the pressure off of them to know that, uh, that, that, you know, we'll, we'll get through this and, um, and, it, and it's okay, whatever it is you personally are dealing with. Great. Thank you. Um, so staying on the people, I, you know, I heard, you know, small business and retail and you said working with customers. So I'm guessing that in, in some amount, each of the uh, businesses represented here have been impacted in some way, uh, at least in the short term. Um, so how are you thinking about employee retention and, and have you had to do, make, do layoffs? And, um, and if so, how are you communicating that? And, and, you, and if you, how are you making those decisions? And if you had to make them after um, going to work from home, do you have any tips or on communicating um, tough conversations when you're not able to have that face-to-face -face meeting? That's yeah, a tough one. Who, who wants to go first? I, I don't I mind starting. Um, so I, I'm happy to say we have not had to do any layoffs. Um, our, our situation, we've definitely been, been impacted by what's going on in the macro climate and environment and corporate spending pullback and stuff like that. Um, you know, our customer base is pretty diverse. So we do deal with kind of mostly small to mid-sized businesses. We do have some enterprise clients as well, but the majority, uh, which is more heavily you know, impacted by what's going on with COVID, uh, we do have some customers that are in retail. We have some customers that are in the hotel. Actually, we have quite a few customers in the hotel business. Um, so we've kind of got a wide range of, of customers who have been extremely negatively impacted to uh, some that are actually doing really well and their businesses are growing in this environment. Um, but, it, but it's kind of, we've had the benefit of that sort of evening out for us. Um, we haven't had, uh, you know, Retention for 
perspective, there's a little bit more of a um, you know potential issue there where some customers, like I said earlier, were asking maybe to take a pause and like give them a little extended time to pay their bills with us or even give them a pause on their content materiality where we uh, can't sort of manage on a daily basis. We are watching it all the time. Um, we've, we've had, we have conversations, my executive team and I, we meet, we have a daily standup, um, usually at noon. So today it's at two, uh, where we meet for half an hour and we just kind of catch each other up on what's kind of going on in each other's organizations. But one of the things that we talk about pretty much daily is how is the business doing? Where are we seeing areas where we're concerned or where are we seeing areas of opportunity? Um, so we've definitely been preparing for if we if we start to see something bigger happen, uh, where would we pull back on spending? Um, for us, we, we operate extremely lean as it is uh, from a headcount perspective based on what, what we do. So uh, we're, we would try not to do layoffs if at all possible. That would be a last resort for us. So we, we've looked at things like discretionary. I mean, actually the good news is for most of us, if you have um, a tech company and you, you stock your, you know, your kitchen with food and um, you have people that are traveling, all that expense is sort of gone right now. So there's some natural savings that, that, that it's coming from just being in this environment. And um, we're, we're being a little bit more careful about, you know, anything that, that's spending, of, a source of spending of cash. Um, we might be s slowing down on replacement racks if we have open positions, but that's going to naturally happen in this environment anyway, because most people aren't trying to look for a new job or change jobs or onboard into a new job in this situation. Um, and it's definitely a topic of conversation uh, with our board of directors and our investors. Uh, get very frequent touch points. They're, they're you know, dealing with this all across our portfolio companies. Again, there's a wide range of experiences that they're having. Um, some of their companies have laid off the majority of their staff. Some of them have done small layoffs. Some of their executives aren't taking salaries right now. Um, so there's just a lot of different things going on. And so just, I think, again, it's a communication thing. Uh, we've also communicated uh, with the, the employees that, hey, we're okay right now. We had a good Q1. Um, we're keeping an eye on it. We'll kind of keep, you know, we'll keep you updated just to give them a little bit of peace of mind on, on what's going on. Without, obviously, you can't get uh, full transparency there, but um, as much as we, as we can to provide people with a level of comfort. But um, I'm happy to say, at least for our specific situation, that, uh, that we're, we're, we have not had to do any layoffs and are kind of cutting back on spend in areas that are a little less painful than, than something like that. Jake? Yeah. Or Kate, Kate's got her mic. <laughs> Jake, you go first. Okay. <laughs> so we also haven't um, laid off or furloughed anyone. Um, and we're, I guess, rigorously looking at what we believe are leading indicators in order to understand you know health of the business with the downturn one of the things that has been really beneficial is a, a fellow portfolio companies um, and the data that they have access to and then b our own data because one of the things that we do is um, college student verification globally and so we were able to see trends in italy for example when their universities shut down and then everybody had to stay at home. And that was a couple of weeks before um, those decisions were made in other countries. So we're trying to read the tea leaves, find any patterns that are applicable, apply those in our modeling, and you know, understand what we have ahead. Um, and then in the end, the key is for everybody to do you know, their best work and be super productive and contribute in the way that they can contribute. Um, and we have been making adjustments uh, in terms of those contributions, areas of expertise, and again, um, experiments or, or new things that we had underway versus uh, going just to pure core. Um, but yeah, you know, very I think he might have froze. Oh, is he back? Yeah, okay. I, we were all froze, or I was frozen. Kate? Yeah, do you want me to? Yeah, yeah. so um, we also have not um, had to do any layoffs or furloughs. Um, one of our kind of guiding principles that we have operated under is let's proactively plan for um, an 18-month downturn window. 
and let's look at every core driver of our business and assume that we are going to see a sustained downturn for at least six months. So how do we, we're going to ramp to that downturn on every key driver of our revenue. So total number of pieces of new business, our average MRR, our churn rate and our retention rates. Um, and, we re and we modeled that out and said, what does our business look like and how do we need to proactively plan to manage our cost and our ex expenses should we have a sustained significant downturn for six months, but we're not back to how we were before COVID until 18 months from now. And the guiding principle that we had is, can we actually continue to run the business without actually A, laying off any employees and B, reducing their hours and or their wage. Um, so that is the process that we chose to go through to try and protect those critical employee jobs uh, which again is so core to our service offering to our customers as well. So we did go through that process and there were some hard decisions that needed to get made very quickly. We immediately said, okay, this is for our existing employees. So we had 23 job offers out for a brand new receptionist pool to start. We rescinded those offers. It was a very hard thing to do, but when you go from 5% turnover in a frontline workforce to zero overnight, you can't really afford to add those extra bodies and have to care and feed for those extra bodies as well. Um, and additionally, we decided we were very, um, Ruby as a business has been historically very generous with cost of living increases on an annual basis. We have delayed our cost of living annual um, increases for the next 90 days until we have more data. And we've said in 90 days, we'll make another decision if we have to delay another 90 days, but the intention and the purpose was really to provide continuity of income and we've been extraordinarily transparent with our employees that we have put together that plan. Our job is to make sure that they know they have a job, that they have predictable income and predictable wage right now. And the, uh, the outpouring from our employee base was unbelievable. That every, really, it was just nothing but thank you so much. I've been so concerned. My mom lost their job. My roommate lost my job. Their boyfriend lost their job. And they're seeing it, this, this is touching everybody um, so personally, that just being able to log on in the morning to start their shift with, with confidence and comfort that they have a job was so critical. However, we did we have looked at every level of discretionary spend and there are some beneficial savings of not having to fund a bunch of offices right now with coffee and supplies and all of the things that come with it. Um, and we, uh, we've been also doing some things proactively at, in reviewing insurance policies and getting ourselves in a queue for disruptive business um, for things that are just proactively going to have a very long process and a very long queue to be able to manage. Great, thank you. Well, I hope that's an indicator that all three of you have not instituted any um, layoffs or reduction in forces. So um, that's very encouraging and uh, and well done, everyone. It sounds like you're making great business decisions and looking, you know, and being mindful about that as well. Um, I want to make sure we have plenty of time to talk about Oh no. If only we knew what she was about to say. Yeah, so <laughs> um, okay, let's, uh, we did have a, well, we did talk, okay, we just talked about the layoffs. Um, let's see what else we can, what else is on our list here? Perhaps talking about uh, customers? Yeah, yeah, let's go to customers. How are you? I, I know you guys touched a little bit on this, you're deferring payments to later on down the line, but, you know, are you making those out? You know, are you actively making those calls? Or are you waiting for those folks to call you? How are you handling? Um, how are you handling that? Uh, I'll, I'll go start with Kate. Yeah. Kate uh, Johnson. KJ. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> um, yeah. We ours is a mix. Um, so we have an account management team uh, and, and also customer success managers who whose job it is to to speak to their customers on a regular basis. So they are reaching out, um, checking in, seeing how things are going. Uh, we did put out, uh, so probably about two weeks ago, maybe almost three weeks ago now, time is kind of a blur, uh, an offer out to our entire customer base to say, um, the, the way that we charge for our product is based on usage, but we put an offer out to all of our customers saying, if you need to increase your usage right now, 
uh, for COVID related communications uh, with your customers, um, we will give you that for free. So we, and a lot of our customers took us up on that offer. So um, they either saw the communication that came out in the form of an email or an account manager reached out to them. They were very appreciative of that because a lot of people are needing to do more communications and sometimes even with their employees. Uh, so we did that as a, as, as a, as a one-time thing to be helpful as much as we could be. Um, as it relates to sort of the request for, you know, payments and, and things like that, mostly they're reaching out to us, but it's coming through a mix of, of different types of conversations with our strategic customers, more strategic customers, we're reaching out, uh, having the conversation with them, asking them if there's anything we can do to be helpful. That's obviously a balance, right? Because um, if we do too much of that, then our business is hurt. So it's a, it's a balance. We're trying to do the right thing where it makes sense. Um, there's also, I don't know if, if Jake and, and KW, if you guys are experiencing this as well, but there's a lot of advice out there right now. A lot of CEOs, a lot of management teams are getting a lot of advice from a lot of different directions. Some of it's pretty extreme, um, like just stop paying your rent and uh, don't pay any of your vendors. You know, if you were paying them in 30 days, now pay them in 90 days. Even if you aren't really in a financial situation where that's a necessity, um, my personal opinion on that is not to do that because I think it's going to make it's adding to the problem. It's going to make the problem worse. I want to have that flexibility with my customers where they truly need it, where I can offer that to them without having the ones who don't actually need it asking for it as well and having to do that. So I think it is, it is, it is definitely a balance. Um, and, but you know, for us, it's a personal kind of conversation with the customer to really understand. We don't just blanket say yes or no. We, we have a conversation, understand what do they need? What are they asking for? What's their situation? And then some creativity even on, on how we sort of try to provide a solution to them. So that's kind of what our situation is. Ours is um, pretty much identical as well. So while we do, we, we have a customer success team that is proactively managing and looking at the data for our customers that have seen a significant reduction in call volume, in chat volume. And, and we've correlated that data against their segment because it's really the segment and or the geographic city, um, whether or not they're a shelter-based city that have impacted um, those particular clients. And we're proactively reaching out using data to that client set and saying, how can we help you? We've noticed you've had a 50% reduction in your inbound call volume. We've noticed that your website traffic has declined. Do we need to put you on a minimal maintenance program or do we need to talk about extended payment terms so we're being proactive with the folks that we know are impacted the most and offering ways to help them um, get through the next 90 days um, i will tell you all of our proactive outreach and even we, we have seen a little bit of an uptick in churn however the churn i would say is is almost fully um, what i would categorize as temporary so we're capturing that within our data where the client is specifically saying as soon as I can get out from shelter, I will be actually back in business and I need to be able to turn this on, but I'm trying to be scrappy and do anything and everything I can for the next 60 to 90 days until I know I can get my office back open. So we've also even set automatic programs for remarketing and retargeting from our account management team to those folks as soon as their geographic city is released from shelter, um, et cetera. The, um, the other thing that we're doing is getting creative with ways to have our small business community help us identify other small businesses in need. So we've given a form to our clients as we're proactively reaching out and saying, one way we can help you is why don't we, why don't we use, you, use you for lead generation? Do you know any other small businesses in your community that are really struggling with the distributed workforce that are having a hard time getting phone calls and getting things answered and getting their chat answered? And, we'll pay you $25 for each lead that you send us and we'll put it as a credit on your bill. So we can help reduce your bill, but it gives us the opportunity to actually get a qualified lead in the door to help you even find new business inappropriate segments that are less impacted by COVID-19 to help us actually offset a little bit of that tick up and churn. And that, would, that has actually driven a surge in new business for us, particularly from that customer referral element. And just real quickly at Sheer ID, we've gone into um, our modeling to assume um, slower collections, assume uh, more, uh, you know, write downs or, you know, uncollected um, potentially revenues. Um, but we aren't seeing that behavior yet. And I do agree with KJ in that um, 
in any way, shape, or form that still is responsible in terms of uh, our responsibility to maximize shareholder value and uh, and you know the entity uh, that is our business first. Um, I, I do think that there's real ripple effects and that actions speak louder than words in terms of how we behave um, as a business, you know, with our vendors, with our partners, um, and, you know, not unnecessarily holding back or, you know, plugging the problem into an amplifier and all of a sudden no businesses are trading any currencies and they're just waiting to see how things recover and when. I don't think that uh, is a real viable or, or responsible um, choice. Um, thank you guys. I'm sorry, I lost you for a minute. I switched over to my iPad, so hopefully a more reliable format. I can only see one of you, so I can only see Jake right now. Um, okay, so, so marketing in the age of COVID, what have you stopped doing? What have you started doing? How have you shifted your messaging? Who, how have you shifted who you're marketing to? What are, what are all the things um, that, that you're reconsidering and have, have become part of your marketing? And I guess I, I would say also uh, account-based selling too. Um, so Jake, I can see you, you wanna go first? Yeah, sure. So we made the decision, Kate's not gonna like this, but we made the decision uh, for our, our outbound prospecting um, that we wanted to put automation on pause. What we didn't want to do is just start, you know, like firing these messages to everybody on the list and, you know, looking like the one who's like trying to get the meeting or trying to get the, to the inbox when it's not, um, you know, core. Um, from the SDR front, what we've decided to do is really, you know, craft and, and, and author messages that are very specific to the prospect and really only try and engage if there's something super relevant. Um, so we did release publicly and, and previous to that for the last two weeks, I've been working on this as a passion project um, that we're offering a verification of nurses and, uh, and doctors. So, you know, frontline healthcare workers uh, for free uh, for companies who are giving their products and services away for free to help those, those frontline individuals. And I think that we'll have more of that. Uh, for first responders, for military, and for others. And so any, anywhere where, you know, we can be relevant or helpful, um, you know, that's where we're focusing. Uh, what we don't want to do, uh, you know, we believe very much in, you know, no second chance for a first impression. So during these times, it's not when you want to be, um, you know, talking about supercharging your customer acquisition strategy by spending more money. Um, and so I, I think, you know, it, it's really about A, a focus on the existing customer base, B, a focus on prospective customers where what we do is, is relevant and can really have a measurable impact and, and measurable and deliver measurable value. And then uh, just, you know, maybe relaxing a little bit of the, uh, of the automation. Hey, Jill, move your iPad up a little bit. There you go. I can see your face again. Oh. So, so I'll, I'll, I'll do a real quick one and I'll turn it over to you, KW. Um, yeah, no, I don't like that you turned off your automation, Jake. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, so, so I think it's kind of similar. Um, we're, we're making sure that our messaging is relevant. Uh, you know, there, there's, there's definitely messaging that, that's not wanted right now. Um, and there's, there's stuff that's really relevant. Um, interesting for us is that uh, our tool um, is less expensive than some of our competitive tools and one of the one of the messaging that actually from a marketing perspective and an outbound uh, sales and SDR perspective that has really resonated over the last few weeks with us is the fact that uh, lots of companies most companies CFOs um, are asking all, all, all the other executives and leaders of the company to look for ways to save money and so um, marketers are included in that. And so we have actually run a few campaigns, uh, outbound campaigns, uh, talking about, uh, you know, against our competition that we are less, uh, less expensive. So if, hey, if your CFO is looking to, to save money in this environment, maybe now's the right time to have a conversation with us. And um, interestingly enough, we've gotten a lot of traction from that and a lot of responses. Um, whereas I would say previously when we would do stuff like that, the, the responses would be somewhat limited because 
as everybody knows, when you're using the tool, um, you know, switching costs are high. It's, it's, it's you know, it's just less, you know, path of least resistance. So those types of communications and those conversations, while um, they're all obviously a little bit self-serving for the company, um, people are really interested in having them right now. It's not, a, and we've had to have the conversation actually with the sales organization to say, as long as it's done in the right way, it's not offensive. Um, people are actually looking for lots of different ways to do things more cost effectively right now in this environment. Uh, so it's, it's okay for you to have these conversations. So that's kind of been an uh, interesting balance that we've, we've had to, to have with uh, the marketing and, and the sales team. Um, but I think the, and to your point, Jake, I think the, it's got to be, it's got to be thoughtful. It can't be a mass message that goes out to, this, to everybody at the same, the same message. Um, it's got to be relevant to, to the situation and to their circumstance. Yeah, and we've made um, a ton of changes to our marketing. So number one is we thoroughly um, leaned in heavily on data, meaning um, we do have, we're fortunate enough where a lot of our customers are in vertical segments that have not been significantly impacted from COVID-19. However, we do have some segments like orthodontists that are completely shut down. So one, We've gone through and analyzed data from the last three weeks at what has been working from a new business perspective. What segments are we actually seeing an increase in demand um, because of distributed workforces? What geographic areas and their correlation with shelter are actually driving higher demand? So we can actually turn and focus all of our marketing spend to be, to be core to those specific areas right now because going after more orthodontists right now isn't, isn't a good use of that spend. The other thing that we've been doing is we've actually determined that um, that our customers, and, and this has historically been true for Ruby, are our best sources of leads right now. And those word of mouth referrals that come in are actually one call closes for us. So we're really even leaning in heavily on our existing customer base and using the credibility of our customer base to help us A, get to people in need faster but also getting that warm referral. Um, so that has been one of the core drivers of the increase in the demand that we've seen because it's A, targeted, and B, it's coming from word of mouth referral. And two, it gives us the opportunity to, to give again that lead kickback to our existing customers to give them some benefit as well. And of course, from a, a customer acquisition perspective, that's way lower than my new business customer acquisition. So it's a good investment as well. Um, goodwill, good investment and stick your customers. The other thing that we're doing is, is we are finding that um, the message really matters right now. We've been A-B testing a lot of our messaging, whether it be radio messaging, email messaging, all the automation that we're using. We're changing the cadence of our remarketing because everyone is being hammered right now. And we're being very thoughtful about how we're doing uh, remarketing as well. You know, true database remarketing on, on what is real engagement. Um, otherwise, we will actually flood our SDRs with a whole bunch of activity that really is a five, six, seven call close and not focusing them on the, um, the activities that really matter right now and for the customers that are in need. The one area, interestingly enough, that, um, that we have not pulled back on, and it's, it's largely because we are in a segment where um, what Ruby does in virtual live virtual reception services and even live chat from some perspective is not that well known in the market. Our, our fundamental issue is actually education. This is not a common situation. This is not a common tool that folks have like getting a marketing automation system, buying security for their network, getting VPN software, et cetera. So um, we have found that our radio spend, when we actually did a slight increase in our radio spend, every single channel followed with a bump in an increase. And so for us, we're paying very much attention to the opportunity around awareness and finding those folks out there who are actually looking for a solution and being able to cap capture them through awareness campaigns. That's great, thanks you guys. Um, so in, in the post COVID world, have, have you examined or looked at changing your product roadmap, whether it's innovations that were at the back of your roadmap that are now first and foremost, other things scrapped or completely new innovations or acquisition targets, um, anything changing with your product roadmap given the, the, the situation. Kate looks like she has it. I know, like, yes! <laughs> 
Uh, we've got a, a bunch of things going on. Our long-term product roadmap has not changed from a continually delivering new feature functionality to our existing customers. However, there are things that we have chosen to accelerate and accelerate significantly because of the impact of COVID. And, and one simple example is we, uh, we started beta testing recently the ability to provide 24 by 7 by 365 service. Today, we're, we're effectively a 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Um, business. However, if we were to look at that data that I just mentioned, a lot of our new business demand is coming from the home services market because people are living and working in their homes right now and things are breaking left and right and they don't necessarily break between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. And so we're seeing a significant amount of demand for not only our call curve changing, our call curve, as Jill well knows, has been so predictable for 17 years in a row and our call curve just flattened and the day got longer. And so what we used to say 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. with a big bump in the middle, it is now 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. and we don't have this massive peak in the middle of the day that we used to. First time in 17 years that we've seen this. Wow, so you flatten the curve. We flatten the curve. So we're doing a lot of things from a the perspective of not only looking at an interesting thing about being work from home, but 24 by 7 is giving us access to a new market that we would otherwise not be able to successfully serve. So we've accelerated the delivery of that product. We launched it a month early. And we're now actually from work from home, interestingly enough, we have better coverage and more demand for our receptionists wanting to work that shift because they have kids at home and because they're taking care of their parents, it actually is giving them balance and helping solve a completely different problem in workforce management when you do have other people in your home and demand on the systems when you actually have four roommates and you're all on Zoom meetings at the same time. So it's um, that was one of the key things that we have changed. We are also looking at other ways to provide introductory product that is more, I'll call it AI focused for our customers. Today we're a live answer service, but we are a live answer service that for some customers, because we have a human interaction, the cost is higher than they are willing to pay for something they've never used before. So we're accelerating some additional investments in some entry level AI to help us get our customers an okay solution so we can kind of measure the value and really demonstrate value and benefit to our customers so that we can then say, okay, you are or you are not ready and perhaps the answer is you are not ready to really actually get the benefit of live service. Right, thank you. Anyone else made changes or to your roadmap? Yeah, I think just real briefly, we've made changes to accelerate things that are most relevant. So um, data partnerships in uh, Europe and elsewhere in order to help, again, with physicians and nurses on the front lines to, you know, get them, um, you know, offers and, and special products that are meant exclusively for them while setting our sites out a little bit further on some of the things that have uh, become less relevant uh, during the crisis, like our focus on travel and hospitality and verifying your employment for corporate perks. I think those things are, are fine on pause right now while we focus on existing customers and how we can help. Um, nothing really for us. Our product roadmap um, hasn't changed uh, or we haven't really come up with any uh, any thoughts on any reasons to change at this point. So ours is staying the same. Great. Thank you. Okay. And I'm starting to get questions from our viewers. So um, at this point, uh, feel free to, if you ha anyone else has questions, feel free to type them in because um, we're going to go, we're going to just wing it from here. Um, I've got one that is asking, um, What's going to stay in your work from home? Do you see yourself going back to business as usual? Um, you, you know, once once we get the all clear to step out of our homes, or are there some things, uh, Zoom meetings, things that you'll retain, work from home policies? What will never be the same again? Can I uh, jump in on that one? Do that. All right. One thing, just because the uh, question came from uh, somebody very specific out there, no margarita carts at home. That's not happening. Um, 
No, but uh, for us, I think that it, everybody really has embraced video, which we were always trying to get like full adoption on, but you'd jump into a conference call and you'd have a handful who were dialed in and you couldn't see them. So now everybody's full on video. And then the other thing, I'm just kind of keeping my finger on the pulse. I believe in the, you know, 21 times and it's a habit, 10,000 hours and you're an expert. Like what are the things that we're going to do more than 21 times? And what are the things that we're putting 10,000 plus hours into? It, those aren't going to be unwoven from the new fabric. Um, we, we do believe in uh, extending a lot of these things in terms of flexibility, work from home, again, a video culture, and uh, back to what I was talking about earlier, just really deep authenticity and, uh, and spending time on quality um, over speed in a lot of cases. And I hope that those things continue to um, you know, be part of the, the sheer ID culture. Anyone else? Are you guys never going back to the office again? You're digging the Zoom thing? <laughs> uh, I'll jump in quickly. Um, you know, two weeks ago, I felt that this was going to pretty dramatically change the workforce in, in the United States and that a lot of people are going to get so used to working from home and have adapted to it and become very product, product, productive doing it that I think it would change it permanently. As I mentioned earlier, we largely been a work from office culture, which was a conscious decision that we made just being a smaller company and always having so many um, different objectives that we're trying to accomplish at once. It just felt that we were more productive that way. Um, I do think there will probably be some, some requests from the employee base to, to keep some sort of a mix of in the office and work from home. But I was gonna say, so two weeks ago, I felt pretty strongly that there was gonna be a very strong desire for people to work from home. I think though that as time has gone on, people are missing their colleagues. You know, we're, we're seeing people just reach out and say, I just, I just miss everybody's faces. <laughs> I just miss having this interaction that isn't digital interaction. So, I, but I do believe it'll be a mix and I think there will be a lot more, uh, especially in older school environments and uh, even though I'm really an old school company, we're a high tech company, um, I think there will be more of a move for just um, people continuing to work from home or even having sort of a flexible schedule where it's some days they work from home and some days they come in the office. Yeah, there's one other thing that I think is going to last, and that is um, really good hygiene. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hand sanitizer will continue to be in high demand. I'm assuming we will double our use of that. Um, lots of great um, questions. Any particular tips on, you know, social media marketing? And um, we've got a budding 14-year-old entrepreneur who is selling t-shirts and and so for those of you that are really come from marketing, how would, what would you suggest? Where would be the best place to go right now in this age with your marketing? Pretty, where, where would you put your marketing dollars to work? Oh boy, that's interesting. I mean, certainly pure digital. Kate, what channels would you say? Well, I mean, that sounds like, it, do you say it's the t-shirts? Sounds like it's consumer. I say it's all Instagram. Yeah, Instagram. Instagram. Yeah, I, don't, I don't think you're going on LinkedIn for that. And then <laughs> really amazing email sequences using Acton. <laughs> yeah, and that. Thank you. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Um, I've got, so what, I want this to be our last question. So I'm actually going to, I'll give you a heads up. We're, I'm going to ask the last question is going to be, what have you learned from this? Um, um, but so anything related to like security measures? I know I, I've gotten a brief from Kate who seems to have like, looks like she popped off um, for a bit here regarding like, having to work from home and what sort of security measures have you worked with? Who are you, who are you partnering with and what, what are you taking really seriously? And if you have any specific tips, especially for the, the scrappy uh, entrepreneur, what would you suggest? I think for us, um, especially anything that we outsource and, uh, and some of those partners um, like business continuity and disaster recovery, disaster recovery plans, I don't think they were all ready for pure work from home. So uh, it's a place because a lot of businesses deal with um, sensitive, personally identifiable information. You can't cut corners or, or shortcut, right? It's, it's these, you know, often like little things that then become big cybersecurity and, you know, data compromise kinds of issues. Um, and then I would say the other thing is, uh, to use the tools that you are familiar with, 
and hope that those tools have gone through your own security reviews and those kinds of things. Um, I do think scrambling to add tools or to make the tool set more complex could be really disruptive and, and could affect productivity and create bottlenecks. So hopefully you've made good enterprise class decisions in terms of your, your tool stack and your security already. Um, if you haven't, when in doubt, um, like VPN into something that's already proven to be secure instead of just like opening up user credentials and, and browser-based sessions. Mm -hmm. I think there are, um, Kate, we got, we got, Kate Winkler, you're back. Let's hear from security. What, have you had to change your network and um, in order to get everybody to take calls from home? Um, how have you looked at security and how are you, how are you, uh, what advice do you have to give to um, yes. security issues? This was um, a kind of probably our biggest bottleneck in getting folks home, um, largely, again, because most of our workers, about 450 of them, are call center workers. They don't have laptops. So we, are, we, we had one, a technology problem in that, how do we get all of these folks home? So the proactive purchase of those 100 computers was to allow us to start to shift people to a home environment, taking their physical equipment Home. So that was a, a wake-up call in terms of really preparedness. However, we were able to actually make that work with taking their existing desktop equipment home, which includes two very large screens as well. So that was, that was piece number one. Piece number two was secure connectivity to our back-end platform and all the software that we need in order to make sure that we can deliver our services um, safely to our clients. So we very quickly had to scale what was otherwise a VPN network for 600 people that had three different channels to nine channels in three days. So um, we very quickly had, that was probably the most critical um, element that we had to do was really getting that secure connectivity to our backend systems. Um, we have also deployed technology um, immediately before within that 10 day window of getting everyone home to encrypt everyone's hard drives and to lock down certain um, browsers for use. And we also confirmed and certified that all employees went through HIPAA certification for the management of privacy of that data that was now going to be sitting within their, um, sitting within their home environments as well and understanding how you treat and, and create sensitivity around that privacy of data. And then the last piece is we did actually have our employees sign an acknowledgement and an agreement that they understand that this is a very unique situation, that they always have to be connected via VPN, they have to take extra care and feeding under HIPAA standards for that information. And then they need to uh, obviously be cautious of using their business equipment for any other personal uses. In fact, we, we actually asked them to say they would not, and, and that's really what mobile devices, iPads, and, uh, and home computers were for. So we, had to, we ended up taking pretty extensive measures. We are now in the process of deploying audit software um, to monitor and manage all the connectivity of the activity on those, of those computers as well. Smart. Yeah, big challenge. That's a lot really compressed into a short time frame too. <laughs> I, I can tell you. What, what rubies can get done in a short period of time is pretty spectacular. <laughs> so thumbs up, thumbs down, um, or maybe sideways, Zoom, given the security, uh, are you, is your organization continuing to use it if you are, if you were, do you, sideways if you're like, we're using it, but we're looking for improvements, or using, and down if you're like, no, we switched. Um, on Zoom. So where we don't use Zoom, we use Microsoft Teams. Yeah. Okay. We're, we're using Zoom. Um, we haven't. Nobody's been Zoom bombed yet, but uh, we we are uh, adding passwords to all the sensitive meetings. Which yeah, I was just going to say, definitely <laughs> best practice: password yeah. with your meeting without question, yeah. and then don't just you know put it out in in channels that others have access to in terms of yeah. Meeting. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, we're down to just the last few minutes and I see we're losing a few um, people that probably have to go back to work. Um, and so thank you so much for your uh, generous time. I'd love for each of you to share um, as a parting um, statement, maybe 
what is the biggest lesson you've learned or some of the lessons you've, you've learned um, over these past few weeks and any sort of parting words of wisdom um, or um, encouragement for uh, those entrepreneurs out there uh, to survive. Um, and then finally, to add on, if you a golden magic ball of, of, of prediction, what do you think the next the economy looks like in the next six months and uh mm. yeah <laughs> do that first and then lessons how's that <laughs> sure, I'll, I'll, I'll jump into that um well i mean i, I think this the, this is going to take a lot more than six months uh for the economy to to rebound i think this is a, a two-year 18 month to two-year uh time frame I, I do think it will rebound um, although, you know, I don't have a crystal ball, so I think some of it does depend on how long uh, are we in this type of an environment where a lot of, there's such high unemployment and uh, business is not as usual. Um, so I think, I think things, I think six months is probably the, the time when things start to feel a little bit more like normal and uh, things are opening up again. Um, at least that's my hope is it's within the next six months. But I think from, from an economic perspective, from the stock market, from all of our 401ks, I think this is a, you know, it's two, it's two years or more before uh, things are sort of back to where they were pre-COVID. Um, lessons learned or base lesson learned, um, you know, expect the unexpected. I think probably nobody was expecting this to happen or to 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 be running a company in this type of a, of a scenario. It's obviously a once in a lifetime for all of us sitting here. Um, and to, it, it's really, I think, to take it one day at a time, not to, um, Obviously, you need to stress about it because there's a lot of important things going on, but to take it one day at a time, to lean on your management team, to your leadership team, uh, trust them. Don't micromanage them, but trust them because I think companies get through these things uh, together. Uh, so I think that was, that's been a big lesson for me. Jay? Uh, yeah, sure. I think in six months, we're going to see signs of recovery. Um, but I certainly don't think that we're going to be on this like steep, you know, crazy growth path or certainly not back to, in fact, I'm not sure if, if there's really a back to, uh, in the future, um, depending on, you know, what measurements you want to look at. Um, what I've learned is thus far, a, I'm super, super eager to learn and, um, you know, what's kind of unfolding before our very eyes at first, I almost felt like I was like an audience member in a science fiction movie, right? There's like this orange faced, blonde haired guy talking while this virus is spreading throughout the globe and we're making decisions on shutting down offices and whether we should go to grocery stores. So I guess, you know, steadfast in terms of, of leadership and confidence because in the end it all comes down to people. Um, and what I've learned is the, there isn't a, a real at this time difference between personal and professional life. And like I said at the beginning of our discussion today, um, professional life can sometimes be a welcomed vacation from reality, especially those things that are completely out of your control. And I'm just proud of people for doing what they can in, and staying confident and, uh, and not, you know, uh, going into hibernation. I would say our, our biggest lesson learned right now is um, realigning everyone around purpose. Right now, everyone really wants to be focused on something that they really believe in and that they can get behind and put passion and energy around because they, they need something to feel good about. And um, taking that one step further, I've seen a level of innovation in three weeks that I have not seen since working at Ruby. And we had a crazy level of innovation in my first six months. And so the willingness to be creative and the proactivity of ideas coming from the newest person on our front line, um, you know, all the way through our executive team, the ideas are fantastic and finding a way to harness all of that wonderful energy and and be able to create um, new products new services new offerings new messaging way to get to our customers way to support our community members our employees the um the interesting thing is is culture is so important at ruby and 
you know, our reminder to everyone is please make sure you stay in touch with your colleagues and here are all the things we're doing, whether it's the virtual happy hours and virtual fashion Friday. And, and I will tell you what, the employees have taken it over themselves. They've said, this is ours. This is crucial to who we are. We are so passionate about this and the, you know, everything from paint what's outside your window, hundreds of submissions to the doggy fashion show <laughs> with Richard Dog through the fashion show. But it has created that virtual continuity and community and camaraderie that is just so important because I couldn't agree with, um, with Jake and Kate more. Our folks are anxious to get back in the office because many of them are working in garages or attics or in their bedroom because they've got four roommates. Um, they now have, interestingly enough, a level of value and appreciation about where they work, um, where before I think it was a little bit taken for granted, um, and not purposely, it was just a, it's a place where you go to do work. But now what that has done is it's just strengthened the value of community and that the workplace is really about the people that you work with versus the destination of where you're going. Um, I will also say um, I, I am in agreement with everyone here that this is not a 90 day problem. This is probably not a six month problem. The reality is, is we've got 90 days more of data to capture before we have any idea how long this problem might actually last. And then we probably have a six month adjustment period after that. So I, I am of the belief that things don't really start to recover for probably about nine months. And then it's probably a fairly slow and thoughtful and cadenced recovery from there. And thus one of the drivers why we've decided to proactively plan for this being an 18 month impact. That's, that's great. So you guys, I can't tell you what this last, this last 90 minutes has been an oasis of, of optimism and hope and, and, and real uh, joy to hear from the three of you. Um, um, all of you just want to thank you very much for your leadership to your own companies, but also to all of us here in Portland. Um, this just uh, solidifies the idea that we're all in this together and um, I know you are very very busy so to take this amount of time to care for your fellow entrepreneurs is just really appreciated so um, with that I will turn it back over to Carrie if she has any parting words but I wish you all um, health and wellness and a, you know, the ability to be with one another soon thank you Jill thank Thanks. you thank you Nice Thank you, you Jake, Kate, and Kate. That was fantastic. So many um, valuable lessons learned. And um, as Jill mentioned, just really, really inspirational to hear that not only you and, but all your teams are really just, you know, willing to do what it takes to get through this difficult time. So thank you again. This is, again, just the second of um, a series that we will be producing for the next probably um, at least month, month and a half. The next one is next Tuesday, same time, 12 o'clock. We're gonna let the investors weigh in. We'll have Nit and Rye from Elevate Capital, Diane Freeman from Voyager Capital, Corey Schmidt from Seven Peaks Ventures, and Angela Jackson from the Portland Seed Fund. And then we'll have Robin Jones, um, the CEO of Monsoon and Tight Oregon board member, moderate that event. Um, so please join us next Tuesday at 12. Another item to note, we are offering complimentary membership for six months. So with your membership, you receive access to continued programming like this today, mentorship for mentors from all around the world, pitch practice, access to angel investors, and so much more. So please take a look at our website at oregon.tie.org. And I'm happy to jump on the phone with um, any of you at any time to talk to you about the benefits of Tie. Again, thank you all so very much. And we will see you or hear from you next week. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.